Welcome back to Better Than Before. My guest today is Leslie Marinuk, and his life journey has given him a unique perspective on America. He grew up in Canada and viewed the United States from afar. However, during those years, he often visited his American relatives, and in 1986, he relocated to the United States and made St. Louis, Missouri his home. He has since reconciled his various perspectives of an American as a foreigner, as a frequent visitor, and finally, as a permanent resident of our country. His reconciliation process included a self-guided study of American history. By birth, he has a dual citizenship of both the United States and Canada, and spending his formative years in Canada, he's always had a warm connection with Great Britain and its monarchy. That, coupled with his strong American roots, has enabled him to paint a neutral, non-biased image of the historical events that motivated, shaped, and impacted the lives of the founding fathers of the United States. With his unique perspective is combined with his study of original sourced material, uh, we're going to get into that, what that is and why that's important. The result is a valuable series for students, educators, and history buffs. And he is much more interested in historical accuracy than he is in being politically correct, which automatically draws me uh, to him as a friend. I was in a bookstore the week of the 4th of July, and so while I was enjoying a little time to myself, uh, my wife was visiting her relatives in North Dakota, and I stopped into a bookstore to buy some books. I usually buy some books for a reading uh, three months at a time, so I was buying some books for July, August, and September, and the bookstore attendant recommended uh, these two books to me. And in the process, she told me that Les was in the process of writing his third book. And we'll get on uh, with that. I have finished the first book, which is called Irreconcilable Differences. And it's called the American Patriot Series. And this first book uh, contains profiles of the founding fathers from 1750 to 1776. And I'm really happy to welcome Les Marinuk to our program today. Hi, Les. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I also wanted to mention that you're a business owner and entrepreneur. You own the Route 66 Diner and Lafayette Manor Bed and Breakfast, both in Pulaski County here in Missouri. That's just off I-44. And his primary livelihood is real estate. He's been a real estate broker for over 30 years, and he has six Century 21 real estate offices in South Central Missouri. I'm really glad we found, uh, I mean, you're a busy guy. We found a little time uh, to share together here on the program. And I want to dive into uh, your background a little bit. It was your bio was pretty thorough there. Um, so you grew up in Canada, and you have a real penchant for history, right? Yeah, I've, I've always enjoyed history, and um, when I finally did move to the United States, um, it, there was a real disconnect based on what I had learned growing up and what people were telling me that had been educated in the United States. So uh, it, it caused me to want to really study the, the differences and why there was differences. And pr probably somewhere in between is, is where the truth lies. So it's an interesting story and um, needed to be told. So while you don't have a formal uh, history degree or a formal educational certification in history, my guess is all the work that you've done and all the studying and research you've done has made you quite an expert on this stuff. Well, uh, at least colonial history. I wouldn't, yeah. I, I wouldn't uh, say much, you know, much before, uh, you know, say early world history or um, 19th century U.S. history. I'm, I'm just zeroed in on the colonial uh, era. Sure. And you, I mean, you've done hours and hours of research uh, on this particular um, subject and, and material. So, you know, I feel pretty confident that you've done the work necessary for this to be uh, pretty accurate. So when I was reading Irreconcilable Differences, and I'm just about to start the second book, but some of the things I read in your book, I really saw for the very first time. And I loved history in uh, high school and college. I was uh, I think I only missed one uh, test question all through school. I think I had a 99 average in history, but um, some of the things I read in your book, I really kind of saw for the first time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's, it's part of that reconciliation uh, 
thing that I went through, there is a disconnect between what I call accurate history. This is unrevised history. This is history that was written in the, the founding era, and um, it's, it was written by eyewitnesses. Uh, it could have been challenged at the time if it wasn't true, and uh, that history has been revised and purged, and what we have now is is really a politically correct version of of history, and it's and it's I, I think that some of the things that you that, that you read in there are in, are new and haven't been told for literally decades. So I, I noticed in your bio something that caught my attention, something I wanted to talk to you about today is you continuously talk about how you're very meticulous in using original sourced material. So can you give me your definition of what that is? It's a collection of I, it's articles, it's uh, books, it is uh, last wills and testaments, it is uh, papers that, have, that different uh, founding fathers have written. Um, the, the good thing about the, the founding fathers is that they absolutely recorded everything, and, and most everything has been saved. We don't have ancient, ancient history in the United States. We just have, you know, 200, 250 years worth of history, so it's Something that if you're really interested in, in tracking down, you can. And um, the the one thing that that I have um, struggled with a little bit is some of the the words that were used back there. You almost need a 200 year old Oxford Dictionary, early English, to be able to understand some of the words, and and what they meant. But once you once you get past that, um, yeah, it's 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 interesting stuff. Certainly, uh, I have been a student of. Um, the Bible over the years, and um, you run into the same thing when you read the 1611 King James Bible. You, some words don't really mean the same thing as they mean today, and so you can get really confused if you don't go back and find out the original intent and meaning of that particular word during that particular time frame. Yeah, no, uh, that's very true. And and so. I, th I think this is great because a lot of times when you hear people discussing current events or uh, the current state of our country or world, they continually argue about, well, that's not what the founding fathers intended, or um, this is what they had in their minds when they did that. And I think your particular work here sheds a lot of light on what that original intent and what those um, thoughts were. Which brings me into something that I noticed also called historical hearsay. What's, what's that? Yeah, let's say that's that's what I call it. So I, I've heard a, a number of history professors and uh, you know talk about that, and really what it is, it's it's where history was written at uh, you know within a few years of the time when an event happened, and then you know a decade later or or even longer, it's rewritten. But and then two decades after that, it's rewritten. Each one using the previous source rather than going back to the original source. So what you get is um, just the last person's version of it, not the original version of it. And that's what I call hearsay. It's the same stuff that, the, the same reason why you can't use hearsay in a court of law, because it's, you gotta get factual stuff, eyewitnesses or that kind of thing. And um, so I, I don't know if that's an official term, that's what I use. Well, and, and one of the reasons that's very dangerous is, and I'll bring some of my science and my field into this, it's called a recency bias, where human beings are very subject to the last thing they heard. Um, so if, you know, going by your definition, uh, we have a lot of uh, distorted history out there. And one of the examples uh, that you've mentioned to me before is the whole George Washington and the cutting down of the cherry tree. Yes, yes, and uh, the Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings thing. Right, the the fact that he had a child with one of his slaves. Well, yeah, and and that's that's a debatable uh, event. It it was never um, even mentioned until his second presidential um, political race, and it was actually brought up by a political rival of his, and um, so it, it there. It, Based on what I have looked into and researched, the more plausible answer to that is that it was probably a Jefferson's brother 
mm. that did have that had the illegitimate child of with one of his slaves. He had more, much more opportunity for that than than Thomas Jefferson did. So um, I've written a book. I'm just about to have my second one published, and I have feel for you, man. I mean, it's it's quite an undertaking, and it's a lot of work. And especially if you want to be uh, as accurate and thorough as you have been. So tell me a little bit about what what really prompted you to undertake this and write these books. The, really, the idea started when uh, through the '90s, uh, I was I, I was often writing. Um, some articles for the St. Louis, for one of the St. Louis newspapers, and um, it was interesting. People would read it, and they would contact me and said, "Oh, you know, this is this is. I think this is what really happened. This is what really happened." And and the, the younger the students seemed to be confused at the time as well. And so I I just felt like somebody had to tell the story. Um, and it's not something you can do in a single book. I mean, it's this thing's going to end up being fifteen or sixteen hundred pages, <laughs> so so that's why it's a, a number of volumes. But um, and I've kind of got it divided into eras. But I, I've designed it in such a way that a person can read it and understand what took place during those years that each book represents. And it it, it it's laid out cause and effect, okay, this happened, so then this happened. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a way that a student can understand it. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about why. Why do you feel that most Americans, not just kids in school, but some of us have been out of school for a while, and even the generation before us and the generation before that, like why do you think most of us as Americans, we really don't know the, the colonial history as well as we should? Well, I was actually shocked about that, too, because when I moved to the States, I felt like at least American citizens were well-schooled with their own history. And when I started my self-guided study, I learned things, I learned facts, and then I wanted to talk to people about it. And I was, I was astounded that people were confused whether a battle was actually a Civil War battle or, or a revolutionary battle whether this general served in the revolution or served in the civil war, you know, it's just, I, I realized that people kind of knew, they knew some names, they knew, you know, documents that were done, they knew battles that were fought, but they really didn't have it all put together. I used to watch this news commentator on television and he would have a reporter on the street and uh, he would ask people passing by just general questions and it, the reason the segment was so funny is because people would get the answers so wrong and, and it was, you know, funny and embarrassing at the same time, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of this subject matter. Like, why do you feel that this is, this is really important for people to know about? The U S right now, our political system is very pol polarized. There, there are laws that are, that are being contemplated right now that, our politicians are telling us, oh, this is what the founding fathers would have wanted or would have intended. And really, they don't have no idea. They, they don't know who they are. They don't know what type of people they were. They don't know what they would have stood for. Or, you know, they, they're just blurting out something to help give what they want to pass credibility. And, and so that, I, that was the second reason for the writing the book, so that people would know who the founding fathers are, uh, what they believed in, and then once you know that, you can kind of have said, no, they wouldn't have wanted that, or yeah, they would have wanted that. Um, and, and so it, 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 it's just a, a check against what we're supposed to believe in right now. I would venture to guess that if you asked the average person that you ran into, if they could name more than five of the founding fathers, I bet you they'd struggle. Yeah, I do a lot of um, high school talks with uh, history students, but but sometimes just a, a mix of all students. And um, I ask that question always. That's one of my the only questions that I ask on a regular basis. And I, I ask them if, if if to tell me how many founding fathers they, there is, and I, I get I collect a bunch of answers before I tell them, you know, what I think there is. And I think the most I've ever had is a little over 30. Most people say 11, some 15, 17, something like that. But 
nowhere near 150. And even if they did say 15 or 17, I bet they couldn't name them. Oh, no, yeah. They would know the, the ones that appear on our coinage. Right. How do you define a, found, a founding father? It, this is right in my preface of the book. So my definition of a founding father is one who provided distinguished leadership, exerted significant influence, or substantially impacted the establishment of America during its founding era. My definition will be further limited to the following, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 14 presidents of Congress who served prior to our federal constitution, 33 prominent generals who served during the Revolutionary War, the 39 signers of the federal constitution, the first chief justice and the, and the Supreme, uh, of the Supreme Court, and his three associate justices, and 20 of the most influential congressmen who gave us the Bill of Rights. So that's basically it. If you use that criteria, you get 150, and then I added George Washington in, so it's 151. And I think you also, you added in uh, Tinch Tillman, John Lorenz, and Thomas Paine, right? Yeah, most people have not heard of them. That's why I didn't bother <laughs> including them. But um, yeah, so Thomas Paine is, is actually, most people say he was a deist, and um, there is there is evidence that he that he was an a deist late in his life, but during the founding era, he was not a, a deist. So this series of books, there's three of them. The third one's not been published yet. First one's irreconcilable differences, and the second one is liberty or death. Is that right? Right. Uh huh. And then the third one's going to be called Dawn of a Nation. That's what I'm working on right now. Okay. So tell me a little bit about I know, but I want our listeners to know the format, how these books are arranged. Sure. Okay. The, the Irreconcilable Differences is the first book. The time frame that it covers is 1750 through 1776, and it's everything that leads up to the signing of the Declaration. Um, and that's why the name Irreconcilable Differences. So prior to the Declaration, America still had allegiance to the British government. And, um, and it wasn't until the signing of the Declaration that uh, Great Britain launched full-scale war on America. And, and so the next book is Liberty or Death, and that's all the war years that covers chronologically as things happened, what happened, what, you know, this happened, so that happened after it. Um, and then when the British finally sail off, they leave New York and, and head back to Great Britain, that's where liberty or death comes, comes to an end. And then the work I'm using, working on right now is Dawn of a Nation, and that starts the, the month after the British leave, and it's all about the, the, the sequence of events that lead up to the Constitutional Convention, um, the election of George Washington as president, his, his first cabinet, the judiciary, and the, the first Congress, which I have always referred to as just the second Constitutional Convention. So there was things passed in the in the Constitutional Convention that needed a Congress to pass, like the amendments. So that's why it had to be the first Congress that pa that gave us the Bill of Rights. It, it it wasn't part of the Constitution originally. And uh, you mentioned uh, 150 uh, group of founding fathers. The first two books cover the life stories of 93 of those. Right, and the first one covered uh, covers 50. And I was the intent was to have every book cover fifty, and the liberty or death just got too thick, so yeah. I had to I had to stop it at forty three, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get them all in the next book or not. But if not, I'm, I'm still going to tell the story. But there might be a fourth. I'm not sure. So I, there's two stories that I wanted to bring up today, um, and I just sort of like you you want to get the author's viewpoint on these stories one i'd heard before and that is um some of the battles that george washington uh participated in before he was a general uh, when he was serving in the army uh there were some battles with native americans and he sort of became known as the bulletproof george washington and so by all accounts he, he should have been killed in some of these battles. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about that particular uh, story? Yeah, so that dates back to the French and Indian War. So that was really the coming together of the colonies 
to to battle one uh, common foe, and that that was France, and then and they had the Indians on their side. So um, he, during one of the battles, and it was near near Pittsburgh, uh, the today's Pittsburgh. Um, he was in a battle that he got ambushed on both sides, uh, and there was a lot of people killed. The, the General Braddock was, was killed. And through the course of the battle, uh, he was you know, on his horse. Well, actually, he's on three different horses because the, the two horses got killed and shot from underneath him. But uh, he did have bullet holes through his jacket and many many years later they did a excavation of the battle site and they actually found one of his buttons from his vest and it had a just a little dent on the side that was a that that had been caused by a bullet so he was either very very lucky or divinely protected yeah and i enjoyed the part in the story i believe where the um, american indians they developed part of his legend where they told stories uh, about his must be, I forget exactly how they phrased it, but it must have been a divine appointment. The chief at the time, after they realized that they couldn't seem to kill him, that they they just called the warriors off of trying to shoot him, and they just they concentrated on other soldiers because they felt like he was like a spirit was protecting him or whatever. Right. So it's um, it, yeah, it's uh, and it's that's I took that whole thing because I knew it was. That, own, oh, that whole story was almost unbelievable. So I took it word for word out of a book that was 200 plus years old. So it was, you know, it was word for word out of the book. It's a quote. So then the other story that I really enjoyed, um, and this one I had not read before, was about Ethan Allen and about him marching into a British fort. Yeah, the Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. That was early on, uh, before the declaration was signed. So they, they were just, uh, it was a few months before the declaration. So the, the, the British hadn't, hadn't um, launched full-scale war on America yet, but they were gearing up. There was, there was, they had lots of soldiers in America. And what Ethan Allen felt, his, his idea was, let's, let's, an, let's an attack one of their outposts and if we're successful with our attack, it'll cause the British to have to use up soldiers to more highly protect these outposts, and that was the philosophy. But anyway, when he uh, during the battle, he it was it was a bloodless battle. He knocked on the door and um, he told the 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 person taking care of of the fort that that he wanted to take possession of it and the. The keeper, the custodian, said, "Under what authority do you do you demand this?" And he said, "Under the authority of the Great Jehovah." And they promptly so, gave him the fort. Right, he did. And, <laughs> and so again, again, I, I I put that word for word out of a, out of one of my two hundred year old books because it it if it was just my words, it wouldn't be believable. It's just amazing. They just immediately surrendered the fort to him, and uh, uh, just I mean, that's just a really I, I love that story. Now, there are two other founding fathers in the book I wasn't as familiar with, but I thoroughly enjoyed the stories about them. I'm looking for your perspective. Um, and this is one of the 93 uh, people you cover in the first two books. And the first one is John Witherspoon. Father of the founding fathers, I think he's been coined. And um, so he was the fifth president of Princeton. And uh, so he was a Scottish uh pastor in and he was offered the job to take over the presidency of of Princeton and he came to America did to, he took it over and he changed the curriculum he decided that every graduate from Princeton would would be equipped for public office so he changed he 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 taught debate he taught um law he taught everything that that, that he felt somebody would have to know uh Political science, whatever. So, uh, and and consequently, the the graduating classes that that came through Princeton the last decade before, actually, it wasn't even the whole decade. It was about eight years before the Declaration of Independence was signed. Uh, of those, seventy-two became founding fathers. So it it, it um, 
very powerful what he did. And, John Witherspoon was a leader of leaders. Yes, exactly. And uh, some interesting writings in that particular life story about him, about um, church and state also that I think everybody should read. The other person that I really enjoyed learning more about was James Otis. Kind of a for forgotten guy. Um, and that's because he really didn't have, uh, he was a, a leading voice. He and uh, Samuel Adams were the probably the two most vocal in the in Massachusetts during the uh, early, early years, maybe the, the first seven or eight years before the declaration was signed. And he was actually a very, very good lawyer. He was, he was employed by the Crown. He was, he was uh, on their legal team. And he just turned from them based on some of the, the laws that British, British was, was, was passing and became a leading voice for independence. And he was, uh, he was attempted to assassinate him. And uh, because of that, he... He kind of lost his sanity, and he 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 never did do much after after that in his life. And he was he died a few years later. But he he was a leading voice that that kind of started the whole thing going. If I had to name three people that had there was that was the the there were the trumpets of the revolution, it would be uh, Patrick Henry, it would be Samuel Adams, and it would it would be James Otis. Wow. So, Les, thanks for being on the show today. I'm looking forward to reading the second book, so we'll keep in contact on that. How's that sound? That sounds great. Thank you for having me today. Receive weekly coaching tips from Tony Richards, delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a CEO or an entrepreneur, Tony can help you reach your goals and give you a competitive edge within your industry. Tony's Monday Morning Coaching Memo covers topics ranging from leadership development to teamwork to company culture and more. Text the word leadership to 38470 to sign up for Tony's Monday Morning Coaching Memo or sign up online at clearvisiondevelopment.com.